Laura Flanders. Climate change doesn't need some shiny new movement that will magically succeed where others failed. It needs to right the festering wrongs left over from our still living movements for liberation. That's the message of a brand new book from Naomi Klein. This changes everything. Capitalism versus the climate. In December 2012, a complex system scientist walked up to the podium at the American Geophysics Union to present a paper. It was titled, Is Earth Fucked? His answer was, yeah, pretty much. That's where the road we're on is taking us. But that has less to do with carbon than it does with capitalism. Our economic model is at war with life on Earth. We can't change the laws of nature, but we can change our broken economy. And that's why climate change isn't just a disaster. It's also our best chance to demand and build a better world. Change or be changed. But make no mistake, this changes everything. After a couple of centuries of extraction, exploitation, and profiting off the many by a few, our melting ice caps, rising tides, and carbon clouds give us the grand push we need to restructure our economic and political relationships to one another and the planet, says Naomi Klein. She's author of No Logo and The Shock Doctrine, and This Changes Everything brings her back to our studios. Glad to have you, Naomi. Glad to be with you, Laura. Really, congratulations. Another incredible accomplishment. The book does the sort of amazing thing of both being really defiant and kind of optimistic. Which are you, down in the dumps or excited? <laughs> um, I am excited, and, and I, I think I needed to be in order to write the book, you know, and, and I wasn't the, through the whole process of writing. It took five years, and the first couple of years, um, you know, I, I, I almost didn't know who I was writing the book mm -hmm. for because the, the, there didn't seem to be a political context for it, you know, and I've always been really lucky that my books have come out at what I call movement moments, you know. No Logo was at the printer to, during the Seattle protests, and you know, Shock Doctrine came out as this rise of anti-austerity protests began, and um, you know, documenting just really grim and scary information about what is happening to our natural world, and 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 just how radical the changes need yeah. to be if we are going to avert catastrophe, and the science is pretty clear on that, um, and. And yet there didn't seem to be a movement that was up to the task. And in the final couple of years of writing the book, I, I just started to see a real shift. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, say at the end of the book, uh, the resistance started rising so quickly I could barely keep up with it. And and this is, on the one hand, it's it's I uh, it's this transnational space that sometimes gets called blockadia. Yeah, I like uh, that term. Yeah, I like the term too. It comes from the struggle against the Keystone XL pipeline in Texas, um, where uh, even though the northern leg has still been held off, the southern leg was built, and people blocked it with tried to block it with their bodies. Um, and 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 we we have around the world people stepping in where their politicians are failing to try to keep the carbon in the ground. Well, but that speaks to the the Keystone Pipeline story. In a way, speaks to the question: Is is it a victory that there hasn't been a decision in three years, or more evidence of? foot dragging and actually the lack of power of the movement that Obama's not come through on any promise. Well, you know, Laura, I'm, in, I'm Canadian, so, um, you know, home, home of the tar sands, where, which is where that pipeline starts. Yeah. It's a victory yeah. that this has not been, you know, it's not an unequivocal victory. Obviously, it would have been better if Obama had just said no. Um, and I think it speaks to something else that I explore in the book, which is this, 
you know, the reason why we haven't really responded in the way we can respond to climate change, you know, with the technology is there, we know the policies we need to, to, to put in place, but we have a, a, a class of politicians that is entirely indoctrinated in free market theory uh, to the extent that they don't really believe in governing. They don't know how to plan economies. They think there's something vaguely wrong and communist about the whole idea. Mm -hmm. They really have lost the art of saying no to large corporations. And I think, you know, when you look at the way Obama has sort of equivocated and waffled and let's order another review for three years over the Keystone XL pipeline, you really see an expression of that. But from a, um, a, a carbon perspective, it, it's mattered tremendously that this pipeline did not just get a rubber stamp. It's mattered because, you know, frankly, the, the, the oil industry in Canada is panicked about how they're going to get the bitumen, which is what, you know, that, that tarry substance is called. They dilute it and put it into pipes. Um, how they're going to get it out of Alberta. Alberta is landlocked, right? So they've got this huge pool of dirty carbon, you know, what James Hansen, you know, has, has described as a carbon bomb. And they can't fully detonate it yeah. unless they can figure out a way to get it out of Alberta. And everywhere they try to lay pipe, they encounter this resistance movement. And so, you know, sometimes people try to belittle the anti-Keystone movement as, you know, just symbolic. Um, but I quote Casey Golden, who's an environmental activist and policymaker um, in, in the Seattle area in the book. Um, he, he talks about the Keystone principle. And, the, and, and that's what matters. The Keystone principle is when you're in a hole, stop digging. Mm -hmm. The keystone principle is we need to draw a line and say no new carbon frontiers. And that principle has proved contagious. So now everywhere else they try to get the carbon out, they're trying to build a pipeline through British Columbia and they're encountering fierce opposition um, from, from the entire province, but most significantly by the First Nations mm -hmm. in, in, in BC who, whose uh, Aboriginal title rights have been affirmed again and again by our Supreme Court. And um, they're trying to build one to the east. They're encountering, uh, re or they're actually trying to build two to the east. Now they have a new idea, which is they want to build a pipeline through the Arctic um, because the ice is melting so fast that they think they can do it. So, I mean, we're really, it really it reveals the sort of suicidal logic at play here. But it matters. Whenever people resist, it, it's contagious. You talk about crisis. You talk about the need to make decisions that go to the heart of culture shifting. Um, there are people that think the choice isn't so hard. And there was even a report out this week, the week yeah. that your book came out, saying, and Obama tweeted, we don't have to choose between fighting climate change and growing our economy. Here's a little clip from the yeah. people who came up with that report. For years, we've been told that we cannot pursue strong economic growth and combat climate change at the same time. But what if that's a false choice? Around the world, countries, cities and businesses are demonstrating that we can have better living standards and new jobs and a safer climate. So they make it sound very easy. No crisis doesn't change everything. Right. And, you know, that, that report comes from some pretty powerful figures from former right wing president of Mexico and head of Bank of America and endorsed by the president and all kinds of other people who, for some reason, aren't doing any of these things that are supposedly cheap and easy. Um, in some ways, I think Canada's prime minister, Stephen Harper, is more honest. I mean, yeah. he tells Canadians you have to choose between uh, wealth, you know, but between economic growth and and, uh, and 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 this extractive economy. And it is true that there is a conflict between um, between the logic of of, of just, uh, you know, uh, uh, unmanaged growth, let's just mm -hmm. say, because if we are going to transition our economy away from fossil fuels, um, you know, there may be years when the economy does grow. I mean, there's going to be huge expenditures. There's going to be lots of activities, millions of jobs. All of that's true. Um, but we also have to say no to the kinds of the kinds of, of economic growth that are destabilizing the climate. Problem Dan is, Swinney from Manufacturing Renaissance, that we had on the program, says you can have growth as in cancer or growth as in a baby. Mm -hmm. We can choose. We can choose, but we won't choose. And this is why I say that we need to have a battle of values, a battle of ideas, a battle of ideologies, because. The, the, the issue, I mean, like that, that report is saying, we know what to do, it's not, you know, in the long term it's going to help us all. Absolutely true. So why haven't we done it? Right. Why haven't we even done the small things? Um, you know, wh why isn't there a carbon tax? You know, wh why, why aren't we even in introducing those incremental uh, measures that would, that would make a difference, that would at least get us on the right path? We're on the wrong path. Emissions well, are going up. Well, what I argue in the book is that, is that climate change is a crisis with catastrophically 
bad political timing. Yeah. Um, that this landed on our laps at the precise moment when we were least ideologically equipped yeah. to deal with it. Um, 1988, James Hansen, breakthrough moment, testifies before the U.S. Congress, and he says that he now has a 99% degree of certainty that there is a connection between uh, carbon emissions and warming. It, 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 on the day he testified, it, 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 there was record-breaking heat yeah. in Washington, and the, um, the, the air conditioning was broken on Capitol Hill. This was a breakthrough moment. That year, 1988, the editors of Time Magazine had to choose their man of the year, yeah. and they chose planet Earth. So this was the moment. It was like everybody was focused on this. And so what I do in the book is look at, okay, what else was happening in 1988? Well, the, the first free trade deal was signed between Canada and the U.S. The next year, the Berlin Wall collapsed. Francis Fukuyama declared history over. Yeah. This was the beginning of the so-called globalization juggernaut. And so the ideology that basically the role of government is to get out of the way of business. We need to deregulate. Um, the whole age of austerity, cutting back the public sphere to the bone. This has been what has gripped our elites in the moment when we most needed to invest in the public sphere, regulate corporations. The other thing I show in the book is the head-on collision between many rules governing free trade and the kind of policies mm. we need to, to roll out um, renewable energy quickly. You talk about the limits of localism up against WTO rules. and Maybe that story is a good one to tell because we do a lot of coverage of localism. There's a, there's a big appeal to the idea that you can make a difference locally well, you tell the story of a solar panel company in Canada tried it. They got taken to court by the WTO. Well, our whole province tried it. I live in Ontario, and Ontario, in the midst of the financial crisis, Ontario's economy is um, very dependent on, on manufacturing, and in particular, manufacturing of cars. The big three automakers have have plants in Ontario, and when the auto companies were, were facing bankruptcy, um, they started closing plants in Canada, and um, and and in partially in response to this, our government introduced the most ambitious green energy program in North America. It was lauded by everyone as visionary, the target they were going to phase out coal in 10 years and so on. Um, part of the way this got political buy-in was they said, not only are we going to phase out coal, but we're going to require that anybody who benefits from becoming a renewable energy provider, because there were there, there, it, was, it was a feed-in tariff program, so uh, you had fixed pricing and so on. I won't get too wonky about it, but um, they said that anyone who would benefit from that had to produce 40 percent, 40 to 60 percent of their solar panels or their wind turbines in Ontario. Exactly the kind a of legislation people exactly. advocate. Exactly, a bi-local program. So this was a kind of a, um, you know, this is how you get labor on side. You know, we, we had actually the CAW, the, the largest, the, the, the Canadian Auto, Auto Workers, Workers Union that represents those, 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 um, those heavy, heavily dependent fossil fuel industries endorsing the plan because it was their workers right. who were getting these jobs. And in, in the book, I profile one company, that a solar panel manufacturer, that um, actually opened in an abandoned auto parts factory. So you see the transition. All good. All good. It's working. And then um, Japan and then the European Union took Canada to uh, the, the World Trade Organization and said, um, you're violating your obligations under the WTO because, look, when we fought these deals in the first place, one of the things that we objected to is that it interfered with the ability to have a, a local industrial strategy to say we want to produce yeah. these jobs locally. That under free trade is considered discrimination, right? It discrimination against foreign companies. And we and Canada lost, lost um, that case. Uh, and unfortunately, th these cases are fought between federal governments. So Canada was represented by mm. our right-wing uh, Harper government, which of course doesn't want to encourage renewable energy because it's completely banking on the tar sands. So the fossil fuel folks claiming discrimination um, mm -hmm. in face of environmentally friendly legislation kind of reminds me of the uh, corporations crying foul after the Civil War, that anti-slavery legislation was somehow discriminating against them. There needs to be a culture shift. You say the right are aware of the possibility of this because they did it at exactly that period in the 80s that you described just now. You also say that that moment of abolition, that moment of doing away with slavery, was a little like this moment. Nobody could have believed it would happen, but it did. Well, I, you know, I end, I end the book with this question of, of okay, so it, there is still time to radically cut our emissions. Um, we're not gonna, we're not gonna prevent climate change is already upon us, but there is time to prevent catastrophic climate change. 
but we need to start doing things that um, are very, very hard within our economic system, and we are facing entrenched elites that are so invested in this hyper-profitable profitable extractive economy that they are doing everything to fight us. And you know, this is uh, you know, why we have such a powerful fossil fuel divestment movement, because the fossil fuel companies have already laid claim to five times more carbon than the atmosphere can absorb. So if we think about getting off fossil fuels, we are asking some of the richest and powerful companies in the world to forfeit right. those profits. That's a really big ask. And so that this is the question. Yeah. I mean, I, can we build social movements powerful enough uh, to, to have that kind of, uh, of transfer of wealth? Um, and, uh, and so I, I you know, end the book looking for historical precedents for, for, for that kind of for that kind of challenge. And you know, I think there are moments in history where, where broad-based social movements have forced a real restructuring of the economy. And I think the 1930s are, is, is, is a moment that we can look to um, when mass trade unionization uh, forced a real mm. shift in the balance of economic power. Another moment is the abolition of slavery. Obviously, you know, these analogies are extremely complex, and this is not about equating climate change with slavery. Um, morally, um, it's, th th these are not you know, e equivalent. Um, but in terms of what slave owners were being asked to give up in terms of their property, um, it, you know, people have made that argument that in terms of actual wealth forfeited, yeah. And they fought like hell, right. you know. And this is one of the uh, misunderstood stories of, of abolition in, in England. Um, there were reparations for slavery. They were paid to the slave owners. Right. They were paid to the slave owners, not to the slaves. Um, the slave owners um, were were paid enormous sums. And and what's interesting is is many of them you used that money to invest in the new industrial economy, mm -hmm. um, uh, to to retrofit their factories with with with, with coal powered steam engines and, and, and new railways and so on. Um, so you know there are there are historical precedents that we can point to. None of it's perfect. Um, and but you know one of the things I argue in in, in the book is that um, this is all part of the same story. That the story of how our world became so unequal yeah. is intimately connected to the story of fossil fuels. It's a particularly American story too, in a sense. That in the sense that, that that year, 1776, with James Watt and his steam engine, was of course the great birth year of U.S. independence. The United States Republic founded in that birth of corporate fossil fuel driven capitalism. Um, is it going to be particularly hard for us to come up with a new self-image, a new economic ideology, way of relating? So here's the good news. <laughs> the good news is it's only a couple of hundred years. The good news is this economic system is failing us on so many other fronts. We have so many other reasons to challenge it. And I think it's really critical to understand the connection between highly unequal societies and fossil fuels. I mean, this is the story of America, as you say, the coal barons, the railway barons, right? There is, there is something about fossil fuels that lends itself to wealth and power concentration because we're talking about concentrated pools of carbon that require a lot of money to get out of the ground and then a lot of infrastructure to transport over huge distances. So that's an economy of the 1% of the 1%. Renewable energy, on the other hand, yes, you can have big solar farms and you can have you know, big wind farms, but the wind is free, the sun is free, the waves are free, and they're everywhere, mm -hmm. right? So just right there, it is a much more decentralized model. Um, it, it means that anybody can become an energy provider. And this is why it is so threatening. So we, you know, it really is, um, uh, if we think about shifting to a renewable-based economy, I think we are talking about a, a, a more level economy. So coming back to your question about, you know, uh, is there, a, is there a, a, a clash between what I'm arguing here and Obama saying, you know, we can have growth, we can have this. Yes, but a different kind. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of economy. It's a more level economy. And the problem we have is the people who are benefiting so much from that intensely concentrated, hyper-profitable, very hierarchical uh, economy are fighting like hell to protect it. You say they're spending $400,000 a day just on the U.S. Congress. Yeah, yeah. In terms of models out there, 
I was, I've spent some time doing reporting for Yes Magazine for a column we've called Commonomics, and it's taken me to the back and oil region, it's taken me to Appalachia, Chicago, you name it. Yeah. The question often comes up, you say it's fossil fuel lends itself to this kind of concentration, or is it capitalism? Because some people say, if we have more diversified local control, we can have small mines, we can have native controlled fracking, um, we're changing power relations, we're keeping our fossil fuels, we're just putting them in different hands. Can we do that? Is that a, a direction we can go? We have a carbon budget. <laughs> you know, this is the hard fact, is there is a, a global carbon budget. There's only so much that we can emit and stay below catastrophic levels of warming. And the argument I'm making is the things we have to do to respond to climate change are things many of us would want to do anyway. Right. Um, we want to invest in our public sphere. We want to invest in the low carbon parts of our economy, the caregiving professions, teaching, the arts, care, you know, like care for seniors. This is, th these are parts of our economy that actually are not at war um, with planet Earth, and they're failing models. us. Yeah, we have a carbon budget, so there are limits. There's a framework. We have a deadline. <laughs> we're on. We are on a pretty harsh deadline. We need to turn things around by the end yeah. of the decade, and we need to be off fossil fuels by mid-century. Um, and I think that that existential urgency, that that deadline, that framework. Um, can actually be a catalyst for this transformation because there are a lot of other reasons for us to build a just economy. Right. We want a deeper democracy. We want more local control. I mean, you have been working on, you know, you know all the arguments that people are happier, they're healthier, they know their neighbors, you know, they're more resilient in the face of crisis. Um, but, you know, I, I believe in deadlines. You know, I believe yeah. deadlines do help. Um, and, you know, I, as somebody who's been involved in, you know, social movements my whole life, I... You know, I think we've missed some moments, um, and 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 you know, I think just scaring people is not yeah. a motivating way to try to organize. You know, I think if you just think you're going to scare the hell out of people by telling them we're headed for apocalypse, you know, in fact, what they want to do is curl up in a ball, and they don't believe change is possible. But if you have a visionary framework, um, and I think more and more progressive movements are understanding that we can't just say no, we have to build those alternatives, we have to show that it's possible, um, we have to have a, a, an, an alternate vision of how we want our economy to work. Um, if we have that, then understanding that we cannot afford to lose um, and, that we, and that time is short um, and we can't waste it destroying each other, um, as we so often do, um, can be helpful. Yeah. You, uh, so if state socialism is out and state capitalism <laughs> is out, um, you talk about a deliberate economy. Any examples? A deliberate economy. Well, I think, you know, this is, this is sometimes called managed degrowth, which is really not a very pretty word. It doesn't sound sexy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but I think just overly focusing on growth is also a mistake because there are some kinds of growth that we want and need. I mean, there are parts of our economy that we definitely need to expand, um, and there are parts of our economy that we need to contract. So the issue is that we, that we need to, to, to decide um, what kind of growth we want, what kind of economy we want. Uh, and you know, they're, 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 I think the, the conversation in Europe is, is a little bit more advanced than the conversation here in North America about what that kind of a deliberate economy would look like. Um, is there any government that's you know, on the verge of doing it? No, but I see signs that more and more, more and more, there's more intersection between policy and, and sort of oppositional social movements. Um, I think you see this everywhere from you know, Seattle where you have you know, Occupy activists going into city government and, and introducing uh, you know, a, a higher minimum wage, fighting for that. Um, in Spain, you have the Podemos movement. This is you know, out, directly out of the, the, the indignados who are you know, on the outside in the squares, the Spain's version of Occupy now has a political party that got, I think, 25% of the vote. And they are starting to articulate and, um, and envision what some of this would look like. Towards the end of the book, you tell your own story of growth with this extraordinary journey to have Toma, your son. Um, what part did that play in this volume, in this, in this journey? Well, so the book took five years, and, and, and in, in, in my personal life, I was going through this process of, of trying to have um, my first child. I lost several pregnancies. Um, I went through these sort of high-tech fertility treatments. Those didn't work. And um, then I went, you know, a sort of a more low-tech version and, and 
you know, kind of gave up and, and then ended up getting pregnant and became a mom for the first time. And I have a two-year-old now. Um, so this is what was going on in my, in my life yeah. while I was writing the book. And I, I wasn't planning on, on including it, but I found that there was more and more I was seeing ways in which this experience of, of sort of struggling with infertility was uh, affecting the way I was seeing the climate crisis. And in part, it was just, you know, it felt very much to me like hitting a biological wall. Yeah. And, um, and I, I felt that there was some value in trying to describe what it was like to just have the, my body say no. And, and then, you know, when I went through this process in these fer fertility clinics where it was all like, well, no, we won't accept no for an answer. We'll just pump you full, full of drugs, and we're not going to ask why this is happening. But we're going to, you know, we're going to treat your body like a machine you call and it just a pump fertility it up. Factory. I call it a fertility factory, and you know, it works for a lot of people. And some of my favorite kids in the world were born in, in these fertility factories, and you know, it could have worked for me, but it didn't. Um, but I found, you know, even if it had worked, I found I, I thought there was something about that attitude that in a weird way reminded me of the research yeah. I was doing into geoengineering where it was sort of like, okay, our, 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 our planet is trying to send us a message. You know, it has a fever, there's a problem. And, um, and, 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 and now there are all these proposals to just override that. You know, we'll dim the sun, we'll fertilize the oceans. You know, we're not gonna do what we actually need to do, which is cut our emissions. Right. And, and um, so I sort of wove that in and yeah, it's more personal writing than I usually do. Um, and, I, I, I ended up writing, including it, because I thought that this idea of the of of, of just taking care of of regeneration that that's so central to life's life's systems. And you know, if we look at this kind of agriculture we want to encourage, it's you know it is all about protecting that fertility cycle. You know, you can just try to you, deplete that fertility and just and just slap a whole bunch of chemicals on it. Uh, you know, we, this, is, it. <laughs> this is the way we, we try to fix our fertility problems. And really what happens is you end up just displacing them. Yeah. So you have a dead zone in the <laughs> Gulf of Mexico because of all those agricultural yeah. chemicals. Um, so yeah, I mean, people are reacting really well to that part of the book. It's beautiful, and, you go and live by a stream. <laughs> um, but uh, but I, I do, I, I, I like the idea that what we need to be doing is is, is building economies based on regeneration that we can take, but we have to always give back and we need to protect that fertility that is at the center of life. I like the idea of building economies based on regeneration. Um, I like it a lot better than resilience, which is a buzzword you hear a lot because resilience in a way it just sort of means that you can just keep keep beating up the earth yeah. and, 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 and it'll just keep, keep uh, taking it. A lot and, of people and I think are, there are limits. fed up with being required to be resilient. After the big people's climate march, what happens next for the movement as far as you see? I think um, an event like that, people leave it feeling like they're not alone. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's gonna, gonna really be a shot in the arm for all of these local movements who are fighting these frontline battles. Um, and I think more and more, the principle of no new carbon frontiers needs to be enshrined in law. It needs to be, uh, it needs to be across the board. We need to draw lines and say no drilling in the Arctic. We need to have fracking bans, not just moratoriums, and we need to extend them from individual states to whole countries. So I think we've got our work cut out for us. If the right can shift the culture, so can <laughs> we. Thank you, Naomi, wonderful to have you. Thanks, Laura.